My wife cheated on me with a guy that's basically the same age as our son. So I enacted nuclear revenge. I completely ghosted her, vanished from her life like Houdini after 23 years of marriage. But what she did in response to that gets a lot darker. Here's what happened. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell to turn off notifications. She chose to blow up our marriage and destroy the home we built for this dude. Pretty boy with a soft side. She responded saying pretty much the same thing she said when they last talked that she loves him and enjoyed their time together but she can't lose me I'm still the love of her life but she'll always have a place for him in her hearts that they can't still be friends if he chooses but the physical relationship between them is over. He begged her to see him one last time and yep, you guessed it. She said yes one more for the road, right. Who am I to say anything? That's what I did to her the previous night of course, I added all of that to the archive I'd compiled. December 4th is when phase 3 of the final phase of Operation Shinobi Ghost started. The divorce papers were in hand. My new place of residence was set up. Now I had to start slowly moving my stuff out of the house. But first I had to break the news to my boys. I called my oldest to the house that Friday night, had them join me in my office and laid everything on that table. Not the specific spot that their mother had been cheating on me for over a year and I was going to be filing for divorce soon. My 17-year-old was especially shaken up by this because he himself had just recently experienced his first case of infidelity. Yep, his first girlfriend had cheated on him just four months prior. Seeing his heart broken a second time at the idea that his own mother was capable of doing this hit him hard. My oldest took it a lot better and suggested taking his brother in to live with him until this blows over, to which I agreed. We packed up some of his stuff and he asked me if I was going to be okay. I told him, yes son, I'm going to be alright, and so are you. We are going to be alright, I promise. And then they were off. The hardest part was now over and it was now time to arm the nukes. Over the next few weeks, day by day, Oz would help me get a little of my most sensitive stuff out of the house. Give them a list of all the definite stuff to grab. While Sue and I were at work and left him the spare key. This was all stuff Sue wouldn't notice was missing until you told her all was gone. I'd also gotten a new phone and a new phone number and told everyone who needed to know us. Joey, Nana, my boy's big sis and my mother. My new contact information. Meanwhile, I'm keeping up with the ruse with Sue and she's none the wiser and trickling bits and pieces of affection to her just to keep her off the trail while she's still in. Contact with Poss. Not to the extent that they had been prior, but there's still an emotional thing happening. The fog is fanned, but it's still there. All the while I gather everything. And I do mean everything. Every bit of data that I've archived since I started the plan. Call logs, texts, pictures, emails, everything, and started making printouts. Folks, I must have spent over $1,500 on staple supplies. Printer, ink, paper, binders, the works. And I cataloged everything in order from the beginning of the affair until the last bit two weeks ago, December 16th, all into the binders, 14 of them. I then put each one in a box and gift wrapping, addressing them to various people. My mother, my father had passed away seven years ago. Her parents, her two sisters, her brother, her HR department. Did I forget to mention that POS works for the same company? And there's an express rule against intercompany relationships because of the nature of what she does. Several of her friends, POS and his parents, lugged all of those things to the post office and shipped them all out December 16th. ETA for delivery December 22nd to 24th. Perfect. So now we're at Christmas Eve. Sue comes home around the usual time. No idea if she'd seen Peel was I'd stopped tracking her on the out the 18th. I figure I'd gone all the mileage I needed from it. As per usual, she showers, hangs out with me for a bit. I blow her back out on the living room couch. I know I'm a jerk and she turns in for the night. The final phase was upon me a long last. The nuke I've been arming since June was finally about to be launched. In the middle of the night, I woke up and robbed three of the remaining binders with the divorce papers taped to the inside cover and set it on my side of the bed with a note that said, Merry Christmas on it. Next to it, I left my old phone and the business card of my lawyer. I packed up the remainder of my most needed items enough to fill two backpacks, and I left my home that I spent 23 years in for the last time. That, my friends, was one week ago to sue. I am completely off the grid. Gone shadow ghosted. She's blogged on Facebook but hasn't blocked me for some reason, so I'm keeping tabs on the fallout. It's absolutely glorious. My packages have reached everyone I sent them out to, and Sue is getting crucified. Her youngest sister completely dressed her down. Both of her parents have condemned her. My mom absolutely destroyed her like holy smokes. I know my mom has a mean streak. But the things she called Sue were unholy. She's been frantically trying to find out if anyone knows where I am. But those that do aren't saying a word. 
all over her Facebook feed. She's desperately trying to reach me because I'm guessing she knows I'm likely looking. But I'm not saying a word to her with all my lawyer present. That'll be the next time I share oxygen with her. She's got no way of spinning the narrative to pay me as the bad guy. Because I've exposed her to everyone who matters to her. And from what a mutual friend who works in the same company as her told me, she and Poss apparently are being put on administrative leave as of tomorrow. So, yeah, chances are she'll be going into the next year unemployed. As for the final two binders, well, one has been turned over to my lawyer as my final bit of evidence for the impending divorce. And the last one I put in my storage unit to be burned in Joey's fire pit when the divorce is final. Do I feel guilty about this? No, not even in the slightest. 23 years I did right by this woman. I gave her the home she wanted. I gave her the family she wanted. I gave her the life I felt we both deserved. And I loved her unconditionally. Never have I faltered, never have I strayed. Never have I even entertained the notion of breaking my vows when an issue came up. That I felt was affecting our marriage. I came to her and told her, and we sorted out best we could. She opted to find comfort in another man's bed, rather than come to me and say that she was unhappy with our bedroom life. At the time, she decided to step out with a young punk who gave her the tingles. So no, I have no sympathy for what I did or for her. She can burn in hell for all I care. The most I stand to lose is my house, a car, and maybe a couple hundred bucks a month in alimony. But seeing as the divorce is filed under the statue of adultery in New York State is an ad for states that might end up getting waived, or the insurmountable amount of evidence I've provided. As far as I'm concerned, she's dead to me, and I'm never looking back. So am I the jerk jumping into the future? There is an update. Christmas Day was the first full day I spent in my new apartment. It's still a work in progress as I have more stuff I want to get. But overall I've made it my home since I'm going to be here for at least two years. My boys and the oldest girlfriend came over and spent a good portion of the day with me. The girlfriend brought over treats she'd made and also whipped up a really nice meal. I got to sit and talk with my sons in a way that I hadn't done in a really long time, and it was nice. My big sister also came over with more goodies and hung out with us. Also it had been the first time she'd seen her nephews in nearly a year. Having all of them around did me some real good. As if I were by myself, I think I would have just drank myself into a stupor. Everyone cleared out around 8-ish and I decided I wanted to go hang out with Joey and his wife. Claudia hung out with them for a couple of hours, had a couple of drinks, and then went back home. The next big development that happened was last week around midday. I got a text from Nina asking if I was busy that night. I, of course, was, and so we agreed to meet up after I got off of work. She shows up and we go to a dinner not far from where I work here in New York City. We're doing indoor dining at 25% capacity thanks to the Rona. But there's mostly no trouble getting seats because so many of us opt not to dine out as much these days. Regardless, so after we're seated and order our food, Nina pretty much lays all of our cards on the table. And honestly, I knew this was coming. She basically confessed that she's like me all the way back since we were teenagers, but never got the chance to tell me since Sue swooped in and scooped me up before she could. For context, I've known Nina longer than Sue by two years. As I mentioned, she's been on the fourth point of my social square of myself, Oz and Joey. We were the social outcasts in high school, the raver kids who didn't fit into all of the other cliques. Back then, Nina had a weight problem and was diabetic. She was the heavy-set goth chick who was super cool, but no guy would ever give a second glance. But we always had chemistry. These days, Nina is a personal trainer and a yoga instructor. She was the ugly duckling who grew up into one hell of a beautiful swan, if I must say. Long story short, we decided that upon the finalization of my divorce, we are going to start seeing each other. And yeah, I slept with her that night, took her back to my new pad, and we had a grand old time. Am I ashamed of sleeping with her? Heck no. Nina's been a better friend to me than Sue ever was. That's not saying Sue wasn't my best friend, but through near a quarter of a century, I've known Nina. She's always supported me even so much as I learned that day, willingly taking a step back from her own feelings, to allow me to pursue and eventually start a life with Sue that resonated with me on a level I didn't think it would. That kind of selflessness towards another person is the definition of real love. I know it sounds like I'm just trying to justify in my head that sleeping with her was the right decision. To me it was, and I plan on exploring what's to come with Nina and I with total commitment. Okay, auntie, yesterday, the day I met my wife and her lawyer to discuss the divorce. It's now been two weeks since I ghosted my soon-to-be ex-wife. This past Monday I got a phone call that Sue's attorney had scheduled a meeting for us to discuss the terms of our divorce, which was yesterday. I met with him Tuesday morning to discuss the terms I'm wanting. 
Long story short, it's an uncontested divorce under the grounds of marital neglect from Sue. My terms are for division of assets and me selling my half of the house ownership to her. She can have it. We keep our respective vehicles. I keep my cabin. And under the pretense of marital neglect, she gets no spousal support from me. As for 17, which is what I'll refer to my son as, from here on, he's free to choose. Who he wants to reside with following the divorce, which will most likely be me. So Wednesday comes, and I show up to my lawyer's office dressed in my Johnny Cash best, my wife, and her lawyer. She looks like crap, barely holding it together. I give the stone face. I won't bore you with the lawyer babble, but her lawyer presented an offer for terms of reconciliation. I shot them down almost as soon as she finished listing the details of the request. Like I said, I'll spare you all the details of the meeting. Long story short, we agreed to a legal separation leading to an uncontested divorce. The only revision is that I will pay her $653 a month of temporary spousal support to cover the cost of utilities until she's gainfully employed again. Yep, she got fired for doing POS. He got canned as well up to a full year after the finalization. I make enough that it won't hurt me financially. Even if she drags her feet finding a new job and she's got enough in her savings to live off of for quite some time. Once a full calendar year has passed after the finalization date of the divorce, she's on her own. A small price to pay to be rid of her and her cheating. It'll take roughly three months for things to go through so early April. There's no walk-ups. I'll be free of her. So after the meeting, my lawyer gives me some final words before telling me he'll be in touch to update me on the progress of the filing back out on the street. Sue chases me down and asks if we can talk. I figured I'd at least give her that. She held it together fairly well in the meeting, but outside let the waterworks flow, saying how sorry she was and how she never meant for it to go as far as it did. She says she never expected to fall in love with Poss, but knew when she thought I was cheating how wrong it was to betray her own husband in such a way. She asked if I could ever find it in my heart to forgive me, and that maybe in a few years we could try to start over, that she can't imagine what her life is going to be without me. I tell her, start imagining it soon, because this will be the last time I ever speak to or see her. I tell her that 17 is almost a man and old enough to make his own choices as to his own future. I say that I gave her half of my life and every ounce of love that I had unconditionally, and she in her own words fell in love with another man that there is absolutely no chance of me forgiving her. That all the love I had for her was slowly killed. All of those months when she confided in Professor Love to Peel was, rather than coming to me and telling me she had any issues with how things were going with us, I told her I loved who she once was, but I hate who stands before me, and that if I never see her again, it'll be too soon. Here we are on the sidewalk in Midtown Manhattan, her making a scene, crying her eyes out. A couple of folks walk by and give side glances, but at that point I didn't care. I wasn't about to publicly humiliate her. I pretty much already socially and professionally destroyed her, but I needed to get the last bit of emotion I had for her out. I finished by telling her that I didn't regret the 23 years I spent being her husband. I regretted that in 23 years, she decided the easy way out was the better option, and that for 23 years, I thought she was mine. But it turned out it was just my turn. I put in my Ray Collins, turned around, and walked away. Later that night, her father calls me and apologizes. He praises me for always being a good man to his daughter and tells me that he's ashamed of her, and that he raised her better than what she did. I'm not gonna lie, I'm gonna miss the old man. My dad died years ago, so he's always been my default father figure since. But I can't see myself maintaining a relationship with anyone on her side of the family. After that call, I went on Facebook and symbolically changed my relationship status to divorced. Yeah, it's not final yet, but in my eyes, it's over and done. Like I said, when I make a post on Facebook, it's an event. So plenty of folks started hitting me up over Messenger, asking me questions, and I laid it all out and I laid it all out that I filed for divorce. It was Sue earlier in the day. Of course, Nina called me shocked that I had pulled the trigger so fast. Obviously, I was already in the process of it when we spoke but she had no way of knowing how far it was along. I asked her if she could come over and of course she comes a runnin'. We knock boots again, but this time she stayed. The night we laid in my bed and talked until the wee hours of the morning, and I haven't felt this level of relief and connection in a really long time. Nina gets me and I can't get enough being around her. Since the day she confided in me, she's all been on my mind. Yeah, I know. Some folks are going to say it's messed up that I moved on so fast. But as far as I'm concerned, my marriage ended the day Peel was let Sue touches Pecker, so I'm about do so. Yeah, that's it. That's the end.
my divorce is in the works and I'm moving on to start a relationship with Nina. I know, and a common response of someone, I said I'd probably never marry again. But that was before Nina came clean to me about how she felt towards me. And I can't deny that I feel the same. We're going to take it slow, and we're not announcing anything until the divorce with Sue is legal and official. As for Sue, I couldn't give a care what happens to her. She could move pure us into our old home. For all I care, I'll be getting my money for the house over the course of the next year and for quarterly installments. And aside from the $653 I will pay directly to her savings account, monthly. I never have to see or speak to her again. Jumping into the future, there is an update. My soon-to-be ex-wife of 23 years just tried to end it last night. The quick version of the backstory is I discover my wife of 23 years was having an affair with a 27-year-old co-worker. We have two sons, 22 and 17. I concocted a plan to completely upend her life, centered around fooling her into thinking that I was having an affair myself. I kept the ruse going for over four and a half months while compiling evidence of her infidelity as well as securing divorce papers and planning. My exit strategy is slowly moving my personal belongings from our home to a new apartment, getting a new phone and number separating my half of our shared income from our joint account, etc. I gathered every bit of proof about her affair, compiled it, printed all out from the very start of that week, filed it into 14 binders, packed 11 into gear for our boxes, and mailed them to the most important people in her life as well as her apartment so that they would all arrive on Christmas Eve while she slept. I took one of the remaining three binders and did the same, only this one. I taped the divorce notice to the inside cover and left it on my side of the bed, which remind you she's had her lover any number of times, along with my old phone and my lawyer's business card. And then Shadow ghosted her. Then we went through all the divorce proceedings. This brings us to last night. I was only my closest friends, two sons, older sister and mother. How my new contact information. I've completely blocked my soon-to-be ex-wife on all social outlets, so she has no means of reaching me since I left her on Christmas Eve, but some of our mutual friends still do. Last night I'm hanging out of my apartment and I get a voice call notification on messenger from one of said friends, one of the few who hadn't abandoned her following the outing her affair. She didn't waste any time when I answered and said she had one to check on Sue, my soon-to-be ex-wife, and found her passed out in the bedroom, foaming out of the mouth with two bottles of empty pills. Next to her, she's in the ICU in critical but stable condition. The doctor said that she will likely pull through, but she's clearly not going to be well after she begged and pleaded for me to calm her parents and two of her sisters were also there at the hospital. My guess is, they were notified after the hospital attempted to notify me, but Sue would still have my old number as her emergency contact. I simply told her no. Sue was not my problem anymore. She had clearly decided she wanted to take the easy way out rather than deal with the shame and agony of the 23-year marriage she blew up. I then told her friend that if Sue's family were there, they could help her sort out the pieces. But as far as you and I are concerned, there is no Sue and I anymore. I then ended the call. I've had a few hours of sleep on it and my sons called me this morning asking me if I knew. I told them yes, but I also let them know that if they want to be there and be supportive of their mother, I will not hold it against them or judge them for it. She is their mother, after all. But I myself washed my hands of her and care little to nothing about what she does for or to herself anymore. They were both a little taken aback by this, but respecting my stance, however, and now that the news has broken about her attempt, many of those friends who dropped her were all starting to surface again and saying that I needed to be there for her. That even despite what she did to me, I need to support her in her time of need. I've also been informed that her affair partner tried to visit her this morning, but wasn't allowed because he's not family. I'm getting dogpiled, on to go see her, but I feel nothing for this woman anymore. I haven't for a very long time. I checked out during the process of getting my payback for her betrayal, and I stand by the fact that I don't care at all for what she's done. In fact, that makes me hate her even more. She's the one who is unfaithful. She's the one who, through a year-long fling with a guy five years older than her oldest son, was worth destroying. 23 years. And now that she has to face the consequences of her choices, she chooses the most selfish way to deal with it. Even now, seeing as she is in all likelihood going to survive, she's cultivated immediate sympathy from everyone who took her to task. And I'm being made out to look like the jaded ex-husband, unwilling to sympathize for her by most of her family, not her dad. He's reached out to me over the last few hours and said he respects my decision to stay away. It's like I never even truly knew this woman, 23 years, and it comes down to this. Yes, I know the way I broke things off with her may have put her in a poor mental state, 
But now, a whole new can of worms has been opened up because either she had a complete mental breakdown and decided to self-delete herself, or she made an extremely risky and calculated move to call favor back from people who just weeks prior condemned her for betraying me. She cheated on me and now she's the victim. Sorry if this comes off as rantish, but I'm here trying to wrap my brain around this. I want to be perfectly clear, I am not going to visit Sue. She waived her right to me caring about her well-being. The day that Sheila Peel was put his worm inside of her, this might come off as heartless because despite the cool, calm, collected way I've been throughout my whole ordeal, my feelings are still very much raw. But I don't care about this woman. I haven't for a long time. I'm aware that I'm going to be vilified by a number of folk here. I don't much give a care. Think of me however you want. If you were in my shoes, you'd see her actions vastly different. Some of you folks are going to look at my history and see the story of what I did to her and you're going to draw the conclusion that this was all my fault and me tormenting her for all those months. Fully her into thinking that I was cheating on her while she actively cheated on me. Then destroying her socially and professionally as a result was the catalyst for her meltdown. Maybe it was. Maybe I'm a heartless sociopath. But as Arthur Fleck famously said, you get what you deserve. I gave this woman half of my life and did absolutely everything to be the best possible husband she could ever have. By her own admission, I had no bearing in her decision to step outside of our marriage. She did it quote for her. Her selfishness knows no bounds, and I'm glad to be rid of her if it makes me the bad guy. Because I will not go in and see her, and never plan on interacting with her ever again. So be it. I hold true to my convictions. She made the choice to betray me. She made the choice to put her needs above the needs of our marriage. So now it's my turn to choose a me over everything else. She can roar in the darkest pit of hell for all I care. Let everyone else help fix her. My obligation to ever care about her well-being ended the day we signed a separation agreement. I just needed to get this off my chest. If you're going to cast judgment on me for feeling how I feel, save it. Like I said above, after 23 years and two children, I never really knew this woman at all. I have no sympathy for her and I never will let her rot. And jumping into the future, there is one final update. I've been informed by Sue's dad that she's been moved from the ICU to the mental health wing. Doctors are still monitoring her mental state. She's conscious and cognitive again, but obviously lethargic. Her father told me. She asked if I came to see her and he said no, and she shut down after he respectfully said any further news he'll share. Only if I inquire because she understands the headspace I'm in. Also, I've scheduled counseling for 17. The first consultation is coming this Monday. So am I the jerk. The way that the AP describes Sue at the end does make it sound like this was the second of his theories that she calculated. This whole thing is one way to get him back into her life because as she said herself she can't imagine life without him. You can never really know what somebody's motivation for doing something like this is but I can't possibly believe that she believed that doing this would somehow make him come to her and forgive her for everything that she did to him which is why I think that's most likely not the real reason she did this unless she is just totally delusional or doesn't understand the depths of the opi's anger and pain from this whole situation. And going back to the original way this whole story was described, part of his main plan was to try and make it seem like he was the one cheating in order to plant the seeds of mistrust or dissonance between Poss and Sue. But even after, all that planning, all of that set up in the end, it sounds like Pure was still wants to be with Sue. Despite all of Opie's efforts, him showing up to the hospital. After all, this doesn't necessarily say that. But the part where he goes full novella on her and tells her that he's in love with her and he has to be with her and all of that, even after all of his plans were already in motion, does make it seem like that. So there's a chance that she ends up with them in the end anyway. The OP makes it pretty clear that he doesn't care anymore, even if she moved us into their old house. So now that you know, everything was a revenge justified or was it going too far and jerk or not a jerk?